Well, we've talked a lot about how the interest rate environment has impacted rate-sensitive stocks in Canada. That has included companies that fall into the utilities group. Northland Power is among the names that have struggled in the eyes of the markets. Now, this is also a company that has strong ties to the renewable energy economy, which is an additional consideration for investors. Northland has been growing through some notable changes. That includes planned asset sales, to streamline operations, and the longtime CEO, Mike Crawley, just announced he'll be transitioning out of that role later this year. Mike joins us in studio for an update. Nice to see you. Hi, John. Um, so, you know, Bay Street, I should be clear, Bay Street likes the Northland story, uh, but we highlighted what's been happening with the, the stock market more broadly speaking. How would you assess how investors feel about this sector right now? A lot of our investors are long-term holders of the stock, long-term investors in the sector. The assets that we develop, that we finance, that we build, they're around for 20, 30 years. And they're absolutely essential. When you look at the amount of demand for power globally, there's a huge amount of power generating assets that need to get built over the next 10, 15 years. And that's what we do. Yeah, this infrastructure story, needing more of it, you hear a lot oh, yeah. about it. The, is this, do you, how much of the navigating a higher interest rate environment in the short term for investors is? Is, is, is the consideration for what's happened in the sector with the stocks? Well, listen, in the short term, obviously, it has some effect on the value of the, the share price for all of the players in our sector. I mean, we've outperformed our peers, I think, since we closed up our financings last October. But the sector overall certainly has been down. But if you look at the go forward, interest rates look like they're set to come down. Supply, chains in the, supply chain constraints in the sector are resolving. Inflation is coming down. So everything that was working against the sector the last year and a half is now turning in its favor again. And if you look at demand for power, like even if you look at AI and cloud uh, computing data centers, right? Right now, they require that they, they use up about 1.5% of the total global demand for power. By 2030, it's projected to be 13%, a huge increase. So all of that power generation capacity has to be built out. And there's a scarcity of projects and a scarcity of talent to do that. That's what we have. That's what we do. It's, it's kind of remarkable that there is so much excitement around AI and then a cautiousness sure. around the power companies that help to ultimately, at the end of the day, fuel that transition. Can you tell us just anecdotally, like you guys are sitting around or having conversations as a team or a board about the AI transition and, and, and the power needs associated with that? Like as a business, how do you think about that? Uh, about serving this this world of mass consumption, if you will. I mean, we talked about it internally, of course, in terms of strategy discussions, but we also talked about it at our investor day a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm. Two or three weeks ago. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity f for the sector. And if you look at what's gone on in the sector the last two years, certainly what's gone on with interest rates, with inflation, has affected some of the players in the sector. But you've got to differentiate between those that have navigated through those headwinds and those that have had more challenges with it. We've brought three large projects into construction, $16 billion worth of projects that we've brought into construction that will deliver $600 million in new EBITDA, additional EBITDA, in two to three years' time, $200 million in incremental free cash flow. Uh, so out of a tough year and a half, we, I think, have come out pretty well. I think the, uh, I, I mentioned it in the intro, but it, it, it bears repeating. You know, there's, there are many power companies around the world. They all have different strategies. Your strategy has long included a big focus on renewables as right. well. So there is, there's that component of the business for investors to assess. You said a lot of your investors are long-term investors. But how would you describe sort of the biggest questions you're getting right now about being a company that has big renewable projects built for the future? Well, it's how we're going to fund these projects moving forward. So what we've started doing in the last couple of years is bringing in partners. Uh, so we brought in a partner into our, our High Long project, which provided a billion dollars of funding for that project. And as we look at other offshore wind projects in Scotland and elsewhere around the world, we're bringing in partners to help fund at the asset level. And there's lots of capital looking to invest in these assets. And then we, we mentioned that at the same time, there, there has been an internal goal to, to streamline. So yes. when you're picking which projects to continue with and which assets to maintain a stake in or a majority stake and which assets to divest or reassess, 
What is the consideration there? Like, how does that play out for you guys? Well, we've grown a lot the last few years, right, and expanded a lot. If you look at the Canadian IPPs, they all have one thing in common, right, is that they have a finite life for their PPAs, the PPAs, the revenue contracts that they have. Yeah. They fall off at a certain point, so you've got to replace that cash flow. So if you look at the last few years, what we've done, we've brought on $22 billion in investments the last few years, last six years, right? Initially, that's delivering $600 million in additional EBITDA, with what's operating right now with what we've brought on in the last few years. What we're building will bring in another 600 million in additional EBITDA. And, and so going forward after that, after those two waves, there's a third wave, which is what we're doing in Korea, what we're doing in Scotland, what we're doing in onshore markets, even like Alberta and New York, to bring on new growth that will follow that. Speaks to the fact that you guys are a global business. You know, it's interesting, you were talking about that trend towards power needs longer term because of things like AI. Right. We're also talking about some hiccups in the eyes of the market right now for a company like Tesla, you know, well known for their electric vehicle focus. It is interesting that we have a big conversation around huge new renewable targets for governments around the world, but the sentiment around the short-term story has been somewhat negative. So as somebody who has been playing a role in transitioning a business for a renewable fuel future, what would be your message on that to, for, for people who are trying to figure out where the world is in a decade's time, 20 years' time? Well, we were watching that segment in the control room before on Tesla, and you, I was saying to, to our comms guy, I mean, you gotta watch the long-term trends, right? There's always going to be hiccups along the way, but you got to see where the world's going in the long term. And there's going to be a huge demand, as we said at the beginning, for power. So if there's yeah. going to be a hiccup because interest rates spike in the near term or the supply chain constraints in the near term, you should judge and assess the companies by how well they navigate through those hiccups and through those challenges. Tough teams step up in tough times. But then look forward, look forward about where, where the world's going and what the world's going to need. And it's going to need a lot of power. Okay, looking forward, uh, you already announced you're going to be transitioning out of this CEO role. I think since 2018, you, 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 you've been in that role? Yeah, six years. Walk us through the thinking on, on why now. Well, I think we, we've had a really busy two years. And the board, the board chair, myself, we always talk. But we had some more time to talk in the last few weeks. And in particular, in the last two to three weeks, about the go forward, about the what's next. And it's always important that we, we laid on the table where each of us saw the go forward and kind of said, when is the best time to do a transition? I think through, through different paths, through different ways, we all came to the same conclusion that maybe this year is a pretty good year to do a transition. To do it. And, and any, anything more we should know about what will go into this transition process, how you're going to be stick handling through it in the, in the handover? Sure. So, so I'm here till the end of September yeah. and uh, to help with the transition to make sure it goes smoothly. Now, I've got a lot of shares in Northland, so I've got every incentive to make sure this, uh, this works well. Everything that we presented at Investor Day, you can do a bring forward to today. All of our projects are progressing on time, on budget, uh, that are under construction. Uh, our guidance is reaffirmed, obviously. The strategy we presented at Investor Day is reaffirmed. Uh, and it's really about making sure that we can, can make, do it in a way that has no impact on the business, has no impact on the employees, and uh, sets the company up for success moving forward.